Thank you very much. Thanks. Good morning. I'm uh, greatly privileged, greatly honored to be given a chance to share my views on the partition before this very august gathering. Uh, last evening when I arrived in Bengaluru, I was amazed at the reception given to me in very Desi style. And I put up those pictures on my Facebook and the whole of Lahore is charmed about the Bengalurian uh, hospitality. So thank you very much. Uh, I would go directly to the question of partition. Uh, you see, there are three books of mine which connect to the partition. The first one is the Punjab bloodied, partitioned and cleansed unraveling the 1947 tragedy through secret British reports and first-person accounts. Uh, for me, that was the major challenge, academically speaking, because there was no template to follow. And I had to devise not only the theoretical conceptual framework, but also the methodological way of telling the story where the archival material became silent and that is on the 14th of August because up until then you find the fortnightly reports of the British governors and chief secretaries and you may find biographies and uh, memoirs of people who remember those times. Uh, Indian feminists had shown a way forward by publishing, you know, Urvashi Batalia, uh, Ritu Menon, and Kamla Basin, how you can go and talk to people and, and then provide new insights into what happened subsequently after the 14th of August when power was transferred. Uh, and they did a study of women affected by the partition, but on a very small scale. Uh, I wanted to do it for the whole of Punjab, and I, I did manage, after 11 years, to put together a story which has since then given me the basic recognition of readers and so on. Uh, I keep even now receiving uh, emails from third, fourth generation Punjabi Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs who want to help me identify their places of birth, and their relatives remember certain events, if I can help. So that is my constant relationship to the partition. I'm myself born 24th February 1947 on Temple Road, Lahore. So things happened in our locality, which my mother trans remembered, and that trauma lived with her until she died in Stockholm in February 1990. Having done that study, I was then interested in posing the question why two states founded on the same day, one went on to become a secular, liberal, inclusive, pluralist democracy, and that is India, while the other one, even till today, cannot sort out its national identity, the, the the role of the constitution and the role of the institutions and so on. And why the supremacy of civilian rule could not be established in Pakistan. Having posed those two questions, I then wanted to find out the role of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, and there were two positions diametrically opposed to one another that confronted one when one read the uh, literature in the field. One was the ultimate compliment given to him by Stanley Walport that while uh, leaders have changed geography, Jinnah not only changed geography, he also changed history and founded a nation. And then there was this other position saying that Jinnah never wanted partition 
and it is the Indian National Congress and especially Nehru who forced partition on Jinnah. Obviously, both positions could not be right. So that brought me in to find out how to uh, uh, look at these two hypotheses or theories. And what I did then was to look at what Mr. Jena had been saying about the partition and the stand on the two nation theory and so on and so forth. And I have uh, argued that it's pointless wasting time on what Jena wanted once Pakistan had come into being. More important was how did he build up the whole campaign for Pakistan and it begins on the 22nd of March 1940 in Lahore when he delivered the presidential address where he lays down what I call the foundational ideology of Pakistan. Using arguments which had been tossed around after 1857 from both sides. It's not only Muslims but also Hindus who had notions of Hindus and Muslims not being able to live together in peace in one state once the British were gone. But these ideas were on the margin uh, after one can say the Indian National Congress caught the fancy of the people and started leading the freedom struggle. In 1929, it was in Lahore, my uh, hometown, that the Congress demanded finally uh, full independence for India. And one year later then, in Allahabad, Alama Iqbal was invited uh, where he presented for the first time uh, his idea of a Muslim state in North Western India. Uh, when he did that, the British reacted immediately and said that, are you uh, uh, supporting pan-Islamism? And I have quoted Iqbal, and this letter was published in the Times of London, that how can we Muslims think of a state outside the British Empire? Rather, we would be the frontline state of the British Empire uh, so that when hordes from Central Asia attack it, it's the Muslims who defend the British Empire. So, uh, Iqbal immediately recanted from this idea. A problem with Jinnah's or, or Iqbal's theory was that his idea of a Muslim state confined to North Western India uh, consisted only of about 22% of the Muslim population of India. The rest were all left in India. So it was a very strange solution for a nation claiming a separate state on the basis of religion and leaving a majority of its population, of its nation, uh, in territories hostile, according to Iqbal and others, to Muslims and Islam. This idea then, in a more crass form, was set forth by Chaudhary Rahmat Ali, uh, who even coined the word P-A-K-I-S-T-N, Pakistan. Punjab, Afghania or Northwest Frontier, K for Kashmir and Istan for Sindh and Balochistan. And once again, the Bengalis who were the majority of the Muslims and Muslims all over India were not part of it. So the question is, what is the partition all about and its consequences and what needs to be done today? I would say that in the 1930s you would also find Savarkar coming out uh, with a criticism of the Indian National Congress saying that people are naive to think that Hindus and Muslims can be one nation. That's impossible. And Gawalkar, the supreme guru of the RSS, is then on record saying that we should learn from the Germans what they are doing to the Jews. So non-Muslims uh, non-Hindus in India will not even be entitled to become second-rate citizens. So I would say that the 1930s is a time when things start moving in a direction where the two-nation theory, instead of being tossed around on the margins while the 
main freedom struggle was being led forward by Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru and Abul Kalam Azad and, and so many others and Jamiyat Ulmai Hind supporting them, Abdul Ghaffar Khan supporting them, Allah Bak Sumru supporting them. So many Muslims supporting uh, the, uh, the demand to keep India united, plural and democratic and inclusive. I would say that uh, the turning point in this partition story would be the 1937 election because a year earlier, Jawaharlal Nehru had made a statement in Lucknow as president of the Congress saying that in future India, we will abolish Zimidari system and give relief to the peasantry. And second, that we will recast India in the light of the Soviet experiment of building socialism. I think when that statement was made, alarm bells began ringing in two quarters, definitely. One were the British, who since 1833 were conducting the great game vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. After the Russian Revolution, uh, British uh, dislike, hatred, if you want to call it, for the Russians had turned into an ideological struggle against communism. So the British became very conscious of what a united India with Nehru in the leadership might be posing uh, in the future. Secondly, uh, in the 37 elections, while the Congress did very well, the Muslim League was routed in the Muslim majority provinces where regional parties, intercommunal regional parties, parties where Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs were not only members in the same party, but also always in the ministry. So in the 37 election, the Muslim League was routed there. They did relatively well in Bengal, where out of 114 reserved seats, they won 40. In Punjab, where there were 75 reserved seats, they won only two, which became one, because one of them crossed the floor and joined the intercommunal Punjab Unionist Party. All the rest of the reserved seats were won by the Punjab Unionist Party. And then in Sindh, where Muslims were 70% of the population, not a single seat was won by the Muslim League. And as you know, Northwest Frontier Province with Abdul Ghaffar Khan and the Khuda, Khudai Khidmat Gar supporting the Congress openly, there was no chance, so no seat there either. But thereafter began a, a, a series of decisions which came to haunt the politics of the subcontinent. Whether there was a gentleman's agreement between Muslim leaguers and the Congress before the elections, or that whatever the result, we will form a coalition government. Uh, the older sort of material seems to suggest that, but later research questions that. But most definitely, once the Congress had swept the election, it made it a precondition that those Muslim leaguers elected on the Muslim League seat, if they wanted to be considered to be a, for uh, the ministry, they must resign from the Muslim League and join the Congress. And at that point then, Jinnah, I think, for him, it was a fait accompli. Either he strikes back or he caves in. So what he did then was, and I've quoted him verbatim, telling the governor of Bombay presidency that henceforth I will use communalism to arouse Muslim opposition to a united India ruled by Hindu Congress. And that, I think, then is the direction in which the Muslim League started uh, uh, developing. Uh, in 1939, when the Second World War broke out, the Congress decided not to support the war effort. Jinnah Saab goes and talks to the vice, 
viceroy lord lindisgow and says look now you t- you should realize the importance of the muslim league and we are willing to support you provided you grant that at the end of the war the muslims will be granted the right of self determination which by the way lindisgow or the british never did they made a very vague statement that at the end of the war uh, we will no constitutional formula will be acceptable which is not acceptable to the minorities uh, but then things go from bad to worse uh, in in 1940 uh, we i have in my book on jena shown that lindis go and karish jena to come up with a concrete Uh, demand based on the right of self determination and hence the lahore resolution of 23rd 24th march saying that in that in those areas where muslims are in a majority that is north western and north eastern india uh, independent sovereign states should be established and before that as i was telling you on the 22nd he delivered a marathon speech using all those crass arguments which rahmat ali had already provided that hindus and muslims have nothing in common at all on the contrary they clash at the social level uh, they don't intermarry their heroes are the villains of the other their world views are always in 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 uh, conflict and therefore if india is to be saved from a civ- civil war uh, india should be partitioned so there is a hindu hindustan and a muslim hindustan uh, initially that's the formulation on the 25th of march 1940 jena sahab gives a press conference in lahore where he says that the lahore resolution is a landmark in the history of the subcontinent because it is about the division of india to create muslim states so then i have shown that that day onwards until pakistan came into being jena only became more vociferous more vehement relentlessly emphasizing the divisions between hindus and muslims and the need for the partition of india to create pakistan i would say the quit india movement played into the hands of jena once again somebody did a, re- a review of my jena book and said that jena specialized in using the mistakes of his opponents and i think that's a very uh, appropriate uh, uh, compliment if you want to call to jena because that's what he did while the congress was all in detention till june 1945 the field was open for uh, jena sahab to go around and and mobilize muslims in support of pakistan promising them heaven and uh, heaven on earth heaven in heaven and all that you know I've, the details are all there in my book uh, after the second world war when Uh, churchill lost the elections and the labor government came into power they announced elections and uh, the congress leaders were released uh, but by that time the polarization had taken place so in the 1945 46 election campaign communalism was used openly rabidly by the muslim league and i have given all the evidence uh the muslims were told that if they don't vote for pakistan they would be voting against the prophet muhammad and uh, their nikah will be broken nikah jo hai wo toot jayega and if they were to die they would be refused a proper muslim uh, burial so things like this build up a momentum and in the 46 elections then finally we get a polarized result there is one thing which probably i need to bring in before we quickly turn to the partition process and then what we need to do now and that is that when the lahore resolution was presented uh, one week later 
Sardar Sundar Singh Majitia of the Sikh Nationalist Party came out with a statement that if the Muslim League uh, or the Muslims don't find India their homeland, then we will ensure that we do not live in a Muslim Pakistan. And I've said that afterwards, the Sikh leadership has always opposed the partition of India, but if partition were to take place, they did not want uh, the Sikhs and, let's say, the Hindus to live in Pakistan unless they voted for it. So already one week later, we have the Sikh position, but who had the final say in this? And I would say that uh, the cabinet mission plan was tried by the British because the the 45-46 election had produced a polarized results. The Hindus had not voted for the Hindu Mahasapa. They voted for the Congress. The Muslims had voted for the Muslim League and not for uh, other Muslim parties like the Majlis Arar and, and so on. And the Sikhs had voted for the Panthic parties. They had 23 reserved seats of which they won 21 and one of them was won by the Punjab Unionist Party uh, and another by the Congress. So with this sort of result produced, uh, India was now in, a, in an explosive sort of situation. What to do when all three parties had taken positions which could not lead to a compromise? So they did try the cabinet mission plan and I think there's a huge uh, controversy about it, which I've tried to resolve by showing that the cabinet mission plan was a non-starter from day one. It included provisions like that every 10 years, there were three groups in, it, in which India was uh, grouped, uh, A, B, and C. A, Hindu Muslim, Hindu majority, B and C, Muslim majority provinces. Every 10 years, if the groups wanted to opt out, they had the option to do that. Or individual provinces could also leave the union. The union government, which was to come into being, had the right only to look after defense and foreign affairs and communications, but no original right to raise taxes. They were dependent on uh, funding from the provinces. So such a weak center was proposed by it. And then the princely states, 571, a friend of mine counted, surrendered only their foreign affairs and uh, defense. Their internal autonomy, which they were granted by the British, continued. So that was the formula, and it's a myth that the Muslim League accepted it and the Congress rejected it. It's a long story in the question answer. I've just taken it up so that if you are interested, we can look at it during the QA session. But to, can, to cut a very long story short, uh, the cabinet mission plan also failed. And then Jinnah Saab gave the call for direct action in Calcutta, uh, which led to the first uh, large scale communal writing Professor Ramchandar Goha has recorded it and I've referred to him, his findings in the book and others. And I've done, I've gone through the reports of the governor of Burroughs, I think was his name, of, of uh, Bengal and some of the British officers who have written the, their reports. It's clear that uh, in these three, four days, the trouble was started by the Muslim League and uh, on the second, third day in the reprisals which followed, ultimately about four, five, ten thousand Hindus and Muslims were killed. That contagion then started spreading all over India, reaching Punjab by March 1947. And once it entrenched itself in Punjab, it never went away. And the situation started going from bad to worse in these circumstances, the British decided to call back Wavell and send Mountbatten. 
What we know about Mountbatten is that he was given a brief to transfer power by June 1948. But I think that must be the overt brief given to him. The covert was that India, united or divided, must remain in the Commonwealth. And I've shown with, uh, you know, evidence from the transfer of power volumes that Mountbatten worked on it. And uh, among the British, there was a skepticism about whether India should be partitioned or not. And the main reason was given not for partition was that it will divide the British Indian Army. And that would mean India would be in a very vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Soviet alleged uh, uh, thrust towards South Asia. And so keeping India united was necessary to keep the Soviet Union out of South Asia. But when this was written by Auchinleck on the 11th of May 1946, his immediate subordinate, General Wayne, wrote, I do not agree. So already in the army, there were people favoring the creation of Pakistan. By May 1947, 12th May 1947, I quote, a memorandum uh, uh, prepared by the three heads of the British Armed Forces, the hero of the Second World War, Field Marshal Montgomery, Lord Ismay and some other people from the colonial office, saying that if partition now takes place, Mr. Jinnah has showed an interest in joining the Commonwealth, whereas Hindustan may go its own way. If partition takes place, then we should demand from Pakistan Karachi port facilities, access to Pakistan airfields, and Muslim manpower. And in the meantime, Mountbatten had cajoled Nehru to agree to joining the Commonwealth, saying that, you know, if Pakistan were to be admitted to the Commonwealth and there is a war between India and Pakistan, we would be under treaty bound to help Pakistan. And while Nehru was holding on to resisting joining the Commonwealth, whereas Patel and the right wing of the Congress was already willing, I think this is their pressure proved to be too great. Jinnah was already uh, pressing the British that we must join the Commonwealth. And uh, Mountbatten achieved that by telling them of the consequences that in case of war, if one was not a member of the Commonwealth, uh, Britain will, help, will have to help the one who was a member. And once that was achieved, I think Mountbatten then quickly went to the UK and convinced the British government that rather than waiting till June to transfer power, we do it now because we have achieved our basic objective. And if we were to wait for a whole year, who knows the Indian leaders may change their mind or things could get out of control. So then uh, this decision to partition India in mid-August was announced. And of course, it included provisions for uh, Punjab and Bengal voting whether they want to remain united and be part of Pakistan or divided and be part of Pakistan and India. And Bengal and Punjab assemblies were divided into two blocks, Hindu uh, Muslim majority districts and non-Muslim majority districts. If either block voted for partition, the two provinces would also be partitioned. And that's what happened. Uh, 21st June, the Bengal assembly votes for the partition of Bengal and 23rd June, the Punjab Assembly votes for the partition of India, of, of uh, Punjab. Uh, the partition was now going to take place uh, and the leaders were informed about it and they accepted it in principle. But the governor of Punjab, Sir Evan Jenkins, was warning that there is going to be a bloodbath unless the partition of Punjab had an agreement of all the three communities. And that was not possible because no division of Punjab could 
satisfy all the three communities. I'm not going to go into the discussions before the Punjab Boundary Commission, except to say that the procedure was that boundary commissions were set up for both Bengal and Punjab. And the Muslim League nominated two members of two high court judges for the Punjab and Bengal uh, assemblies and the Congress for Bengal and in Punjab, the Congress and the six, two judges, the four judges. If they could agree on the demarcation of territory for Punjab and Bengal, then that would prevail. But as it turned out, all the judges supported the parties which had nominated them. So there was now an impossible situation. In these circumstances, and I want to underline this very strongly, what did Radcliffe do? He looked at all the existing formulae and so on, and he finally chose what I would very strongly insist regarding the Punjab. It's 99.9999% the same as the 7th February demarcation plan which Wavell had prepared and sent to the British government that we already, if we are to leave India, this is how we should do it. And so when uh, this power was transferred on the night of the 14th, 15th, and the celebrations of Pakistan-India independence took place, 14th, 15th, the Redcliffe Award was made public on the 17th, and all hell broke loose in Punjab because millions of people were on the wrong side. And then begins the slaughter, uh, which by the time it was December 1947, uh, out of 34 million population of the Punjab, 10 million had to run for their lives and estimated 750,000 to 800,000 were killed. Whereas for the whole of India, about a million were killed and 14, 15 million uh, changed home. Uh, Bengal escaped this sort of uh, uh, carnage because already this had taken place in 46 on a smaller scale, Noakhali and so on. And then Mahatma Gandhi had gone and worked there for peace. So in 47, he was there helping to uh, uh, helping to save the Muslim community and I think it's too well known for me to comment. But the partition then which finally took place uh, was bloody, it was unprecedented the way the savagery, the brutality took place uh, and it left India bleeding and uh, divided and uh, the two states which came into being as dominions inherited this legacy full of hatred and poison and so on and so forth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with this background, we, uh, we come to the main question I need to address. What has brought me to this part of the world? Well, after I did my three books uh, and they were read all over the subcontinent. Then some students suggested that I better start doing videos to explain all that had gone wrong during those years, the freedom struggle. And having done that, I attained a very large following which brings friends like you to wherever I go in India and Pakistan. I was for nine weeks in Pakistan recently from the 13th of January till the 17th of March, in which in less than nine weeks, I addressed 27 public audiences, universities, think tanks, civil service academy of all the places, universities, colleges. And then since I've been to India, Professor Goha said, how many places have you been to? And I said, it started with Nasik, Vasant, Vakhyan, Mala inviting me to come and talk on the tale of two brothers lost in a fair, the India-Pakistan 
socio-political trajectories and how should they deal with each other. So that is the main theme around which I've been going around in India and, and talking to different audiences. And uh, I think I've covered uh, the whole of Punjab, the major cities, Haryana, Dothak, and uh, Fridabad, many meetings in Delhi, Pune, uh, Bombay. When I go back, I'll be doing more in, in Mumbai once again. So what has happened in the 75 years? While India has its own problems and we know them too well, the way majoritarianism has taken a direction here. In Pakistan from day one, nobody had a clear idea why Pakistan was created. Jinnah is on record making statements which are, which are uh, rabidly fundamentalists. Like for example, on the 7th of September 1945 when the election campaign started, he says the Quran demands that every Muslim should read the Quran because international law, criminal law, civil law, domestic law, personal law, all legal features are given in the Quran and that is our constitution. And this idea that Pakistan will be an Islamic state, you can trace from many of his speeches during that period. Simultaneously, he would argue to a more enlightened sort of people that Pakistan would be a Muslim democracy, a democracy defined in the best spirit of Islam. And there is one speech, one of its only kind, nothing before it and nothing after it. The 11th August speech, 1947, three days before Pakistan actually celebrated its formal independence where he said in this great state of Pakistan, Hindus will cease to be Hindus and Muslims will cease to be Muslims, not in a religious sense because that is a matter of personal belief, but as citizens of the state. And all his known biographers, Hector Bolitho, Walpert, and they all say that people were astounded. What was Jina saying now? After all, for seven years, he had been saying just the opposite. Anyhow, in the Pakistani sort of left liberal type of people, they lashed on to this speech, saying that Jinnah was secular in his moorings and so on. And then I've asked if by eating pork and drinking uh, alcohol every day makes you secular, then Hitler was a vegetarian, so he must be uh, a great example of a peace-loving man. So such dietary theories of ideology are rubbish in my opinion. I think Jena Saab basic achievement, the, the title of my story, of my book is Jena, his successes, failures and role in history. His successes in outwitting the Congress leaders by never defining what is Pakistan going to be like and convincing the British that creating Pakistan would be in their best imperial interest once they have transferred power. And I've given ample evidence of that as well. Uh, so the 11th August speech I've then argued was once again Jinnah at his very best as a politician. Somebody must have uh, informed him that if India were to uh, push out the 35 million Muslims who have been left behind, the population of West Pakistan at that time was only 33.7 million, Punjab, Sindh, Frontier, and Balochistan. So we would be crushed under the weight of so many. Let's say 5 million go to East Pakistan, but East Pakistan, Bihar, and maybe Eastern UP, the rest would all come to West Pakistan, which was the more prosperous part of what became Pakistan. There would, Pakistan would simply not be able to sustain the state. And by making this statement, he tried to convince the Congress leaders not to push the Muslims out. And I've argued that the Congress never had an ideology 
based on throwing Muslims out of India. So whether this was his clever tactic, I think the Congress party had no intention. The Hindu Mahasabha said that if partition is to take place and there is going to be a Hindu India and a Muslim Pakistan, then there should be a complete transfer of power, which was never agreed. Actually, on the 30th of uh, March 1941, when Jena Sahib was in Kanpur, the Muslims there confronted him and said, Sir, where are you? You are demanding Pakistan in areas where there is already a Pakistan, in Northwest frontier, uh, India and in northeastern India, the chief ministers are all Muslims. So what will happen to us? And I quote Jena Verbatim that I will in that case make two crore Muslims go through the experience of martyrdom and get smashed in order to liberate seven crore from the rule of the Hindu Congress. These are his own words. I have quoted him. Uh, so. Jinnah didn't want these people in Pakistan. The Congress didn't want to throw them out of India. Uh, and Jinnah then succeeded in getting the type of... Uh, he got Pakistan, but the British in the end gave him a moth eaten Pakistan because parts of Punjab and Bengal were taken away and given to India. Uh, and and the, the story since then is that there have been four wars all of them started by Pakistan. And I'm not the only one who has said that. Uh, Air Marshal Asghar Khan is on record saying this. Uh, Pakistan became, became an ideological state. And I have argued ideological states, whether of the right or the left, end up ultimately uh, acquiring anti-democratic uh, anti-inclusive features, they may be based on left-right thinking, doesn't really matter. And that's what has happened to Pakistan. Over the years, the Pakistan constitutions, 343, three, have had more Islamic features added, more fundamentalist features added, including the draconian blasphemy law, under which minorities have been persecuted, even liberal type of free-thinking Muslims have been killed brutally. And uh, the worst thing of all is that Pakistan is practically bankrupt and nobody wants to lend a helping hand to Pakistan. During this 40, 75 years, Pakistan could play upon the Cold War card and get economic and military aid from the West. Then, while the Iran, Iran Saudi Arabia uh, competition for leading the Muslim world was taking place, Pakistan could get help from Saudi Arabia. So that brought in money and, and other things. And then finally, it's now China only. The Saudis are no longer willing to bail out Pakistan. The Americans are not doing that either. IMF has put conditions which uh, would lead Pakistan to do things which they don't want to because I've also argued elsewhere that whatever democracy ultimately it's elites who are elected to rule. But in the case of Pakistan, the elite which rules never goes to the people for getting a mandate. So our elite is criminally oppressive uh, loot and plunder of national, national resources uh, is an art in which everybody is involved and that has brought Pakistan into its current situation. I have then argued that Pakistan has to do two, three things and these are seek uh, normalized relations with India open trade with India. These could be immediate steps, but a more lasting solution would be that both sides agree that the line of control uh, is agreed as the international border, but as Dr. Manmohan Singh and Musharraf had agreed, it's called the Kasuri plan, we can make that border porous for the Kashmiris to begin with, 
And as we trade and we build confidence and trust, then the border in Punjab could also be uh, eased for people to travel. So one concrete suggestion which can facilitate this process would be that we demand intellectuals, academics, concerned citizens on both sides that the visa regime be relaxed. Let 65 plus people get visa to visit the other country, meet people and see how different they are and what are the problems uh, they seem to imagine which exist. And if that were to be done and we all put in our little bit and keep on questioning this politics of confrontation, of demonization, dehumanization of the other, I think we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Sir, you talked about the elections in uh, 1946. Yeah. It's commonly alleged that the uh, Muslims who voted, only a section of Muslims were allowed to vote. This is the common comment by the Pasmanda Mahaj in India. That all of us were not allowed to vote. Only some educated, there are some criteria. He should be some pass at an education level. Is that true or is it just an assumption? Well, only 10 to 11 percent of the total population of India had been given the right to vote. The male, uh, sorry, the adult population would be 28.7 percent. But the right to vote was qualified by how much revenue you paid. One thing and I think metric or FA pass metric you had to be in order to get the right to vote. Then they say, and uh, I think more research needs to be done, that of this 10-11% of the population, the Muslims who got the right to vote was just 3.8% because both in terms of education as well as in property, uh, they were far behind the others. And of this, they say that uh, in the UP, I was told only uh, day before yesterday, but I was at the uh, Anjuman Uttarike Turkey Urdu that one point of three Muslims in UP only one only two voted for Pakistan. So it's a very, very narrow, restricted vote in favor of Pakistan. But then the opposite or the I think we need to qualify even for the Congress the percentage would be 10, not more than 10 or 11. So the people were not consulted on the future of India at all. And that's very strange because in Sri Lanka, the British had introduced universal adult franchise in 1932. But you know, this was an area where the princely states were, uh, the princes were opposed to any idea of democracy and people so and so. And then you had landlords and all, and maybe Sri Lanka was a different type of class structure where they went ahead with universal adult franchise, but not in the subcontinent. But in the number of votes, uh, seats, reserved seats for Muslims, out of 495, the Muslim League got 440. And the, and the, and the puzzle for us is that whereas People in northwestern and northeastern India, the Muslims, could have believed that if the Hindus and Sikhs became a minority or even left, they would be the main gainers. Why would people way down in uh, Chennai, Chennai and the rest? And the argument is that these are people who consider themselves very special, Ashrafia type of people. Okay. Uh, thinking that their loyalty to the Ummah precedes their own sort okay. of thing. All we know is that many of them stayed on for a while, sold their properties and then came to Pakistan. So none of them did it for altruistic reasons, not many of them. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. 
Yeah. I have two questions, one related to the past and another related to the future. Mm. Uh, so it is often said that uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was the only towering leader, uh, Muslim leader, during the 1940s. So I would like you to uh, like uh, give your opinion on uh, two historical characters, which at least here in India we have forgotten, Khizr Ahmed Khan and Sikandar Hayat Khan of the Unionist Party. Mm. Like, uh, they, but, uh, would they have posed as a uh, counterweight to Jinnah's uh, theory? Okay. Had they been around and powerful in 1947 when the state was actually partitioned? Okay. Uh, my second question is related to the future. Uh, sir, uh, in India, uh, at least in the last nine years, we have realized that it is easier to displace history and establish mythology. So how do we really go forward to an actual truth and reconciliation if we forget to embrace our history? Yeah. Because I don't see that happening in the near future. Thank you very Thank much. The first question, the answer to the first question is that uh, Sir Skandar Hayat died uh, in December 1942. Uh, the, the, the main party in Punjab, by the way, was the Punjab Unionist Party, founded in 1923 by Sir Fazle Hussain. And Sir Fazle Hussain believed in the wisdom of the Punjabi, you know, Sufis and gurus and uh, sons, uh, Bulle Shahs, for example, verse, Gal samaj lai te rola ki. Gal samaj lai te rola ki. E Ram Rahim te maula ki. You know, things like this, that if you understand that all humanity is united in its essence, then does it matter that somebody is called Ram and somebody is called Rahim? So that sort of ideology, I think, informed the thinking of the Punjab Unionist Party. But they were at the same time a loyalist party, part loyal to the British. In 42, when Sir Skandar died, there was a tussle for who would succeed him. And uh, Sir Skandar's own son, Shaukat Hayat, he wanted to be the leader. But the party chose uh, Sir Khizar Hayat Tiwana who was the one of the biggest landlords of Punjab, a thorough gentleman, very secular, very inclusive. Uh, but Jinnah then, you see, once the Second World War started and Jinnah said that we will help you during the war effort, Muslim League started helping the British recruit soldiers. By the way, the Hindu Mahasabha was doing the same. So were the Akalis in Punjab. The only party which was not supporting the British was the Indian National Congress. And uh, so uh, when the landlords realized that the British were now supporting the Muslim League, and there was an inner party uh, tussle for power, many of them decamped from the Punjab Unionist Party and joined the Muslim League. So in 1947, January, when Jinnah gave a call for direct action to bring down the coalition government in Punjab, headed by Sir Khizr Tiwana, supported by the Congress and by the Sikhs. Uh, the slogans raised against Sir Khizr were so abusive in course Punjabi that he got unnerved. And he resigned on the 2nd of March. So Jinnah actually bullied him and s stole the leadership of uh, Punjab from him uh, sometimes from 1943 onwards. In my book, all the details are given. So the second question was, how do we correct history? Well, we have scholars in India doing it all the time, and they are also political activists. I see them doing it everywhere. And I'm not the only lone ranger in Pakistan who is doing it. There are many people who live in Pakistan and question the national narrative every day. I think we need to believe that we are doing the right thing. And once you have that sort of conviction, then like I'm going around and the reception I'm getting, and this is being reported all the time in Pakistan, you just have to see the comments which are going to come in today when I announce that I've spoken here. People are dying to have this sort of confrontation come to an end because uh, the common man, you know, people tell me, my friends in Lahore, that uh, our sales every day was 2 lakh rupees. 
And now, if we can sell for even 5,000, we have laid off all the staff. Uh, we are just able to manage to keep the family going. So, so bad are the things. And if we were to start importing basic things like onions and tomatoes and so on, great relief will be given to the people in Pakistan. And who in his uh, proper, in his right mind would not want to do that. So it's, it's a dying, myopic, ruling class, power elite, uh, whatever, term you want to use for them. Establishment is a, very, is a word everybody is using, the deep state. They are the one who are standing in the way. I think the people are already ready for it. And I have great trust in the wisdom of the people. Thank you. Thanks. May I request you to state your name as you ask the question. Uh, thank you, Stiak Saab. Uh, I am there with you till you land from, landed to Bangalore airport. But this question I want to ask to my historians and intellectuals and to you also, to the historians give a thought and to you the question is that Pakistan always put claim on India that I need Kashmir. But I didn't understand in my life that there were two parts of India which Pakistan claims. One is Junagadh. And in the Junagadh, the demography is 80% Hindus, 20% Muslim, and the king or the raja you call is a Muslim. In Kashmir, the things are totally opposite. 80% Muslims, 20% Muslim, uh, 80% Hindus, uh, sorry, 80% Muslims in Kashmir, 20% Hindus, and the raja and king is Hindu. Now, Pakistan says, give us Kashmir. Bhi de do. Pakistan says, give us Junagadh. Bhi de do. Still, Pakistan says, Still, Pakistan is showing Junagadh as a part of Pakistan. So my question is that, what is the claim? Chit bhi mera, pat bhi mera. Bhai, ek cheez maang le. To you can't Baat be... Baat sunne, agar wo ek maang lenge, to aap de denge. <laughs> <laughs> sir, it's not, I'm, no, no, it's not about dena, sir. It's about, because whenever Indians also say, Kashmir amara bhin ang hai. Baat sunne ji, baat sunne. Mainne kaya, yaar, char jange kar ke na, एक इंच तो मुनसे नहीं ले सके और ना वो हमारी तरफ आके जो सो हमारा कश्मीर उससे ले सके इस सकीकत को मान लो और इसी के अंदर सब का भला है और इस इलाके को रिलैक्स कर दो और जैसे नॉर्मल स्टेट दुनिया में रहती हैं आप भी रहना शुरू कर दें यार ये कोई बड़ी बात नहीं है सो ये जिस किस्म का आप सवाल कर रहे हैं इसका थोड़ी सी बैकग्राउंड दे दूँ ऑन द फर्स्ट ऑफ नवम्बर Governor General Mountbatten of India came to Lahore. Jawaharlal Nehru had fallen ill, so he couldn't. The, 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 you know, the future of India and the demarcation, distribution of things was still being discussed. So he had come to one of these meetings where he proposed that we have a plebiscite in Junagadh, Hyderabad, and Kashmir. And Jinnah Saab, uh, paid no heed to it. And my argument is that he knew there was no chance of winning it in uh, Junagad or in Hyderabad. But his advisors in the military probably were telling him that our, you know, uh, freedom fighters, Mujahideen who are in Kashmir, they are winning and we'll get Kashmir by the force of our arms. And so Jinnah wanted, you know, uh, not to put things to a plebiscite. He probably also thought that maybe, although Kashmir was Muslim majority, but in the valley, Sheikh Abdullah had the greatest support. So one couldn't flatly imagine that the Muslims would vote for the uh, Muslim League. So he wanted this to be done through military action, where he failed. I give you another example. Chaudhary Muhammad Ali became Prime Minister of Pakistan 1955-56 for a year. He was a confidant of Jinnah Saab. Every evening, he would, Jinnah would, he was head of the bureaucracy, would ask him to come and tell him what had happened throughout the day. He is on record saying that in December 1947, 
He and Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan were in Delhi for these partition meetings, where the question of Kashmir and so on, this discussion started. And Sardar Patel said, why do you keep on talking about Junagadh? Hmm. Let's try to settle Hyderabad and Kashmir. Hmm. You keep Kashmir, but don't poke your nose in Hyderabad. This is reported by uh, Chaudhary Muhammad Ali in his book, The Emergence of Pakistan. Then uh, K. H. Khurshid, who was the private secretary of Jinnah from 1944 till September 1947. K. H. Khurshid later on also became the president of the Pakistani Kashmir. He has written his memoirs of Jinnah. Oxford University Press Karachi has published it, where he says, that uh, he talked to Muhammad Ali for clarification. Uh, and Muhammad Ali, Chaudhary Muhammad Ali told him that on the 22nd of December, India made an offer that you can keep Kashmir uh, while don't interfere with the future of Hyderabad. He says, I went to Mr. Jinnah and Jinnah didn't seem to be very, in, didn't seem to be interested. Jinnah, the clever tactician, it seems, or was playing for some higher stakes mm. regarding the princely states, but obviously he did not succeed. You see, the, among the British, there was those who under American pressure wanted to keep India united, but there were others favoring the balkanization of India, in, in, including that the princely states could remain independent and so on. Sir, Sir Conrad something is the name. And I think these people were advising Jena to take such positions. But ultimately, we neither got Kashmir, nor Hyderabad, nor Junagadh. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a thing that we should reconcile to. Take uh, Sorry. I'm Ramesh Shastri. Question. So my question is, these people, uh, the people at the lower level, it hardly made a difference to them, maybe. That's correct. That's correct. So the first question. First question. What was Jinnah's beliefs? Are you, that's yeah, the what question. what is his belief if his own family member or daughter yeah. preferred to yeah, stay yeah. in India? His daughter stayed here, his two sisters, his younger brother Ahmed Ali stayed here. The only person in the family who accompanied him everywhere was his sister Fatima Jinnah, who never married. And they were always together and some say that uh, Jinnah's marriage also broke up because Rati and uh, the sister couldn't get along, so I don't know what more to say about his personal life. I've kept away from these things, you know, prying too much into things like this. And I don't see the point. Uh, his family stayed on here, and uh, he, in a way, disinherited his own daughter, uh, although under Islamic law. Now the problem is, nobody knows what was Jinnah's actual faith. I think he was a faithless person, basically, because uh, whenever he was asked whether, okay, what sect he belonged to, he would say, was the prophet a Shia or a Sunni? If he was, tell me. So this is the rhetoric he used to keep away from, uh, but after his death, his sister Fatima has claimed his property because under the Shia Asna Shari law, uh, women, stand a better chance of claiming property. But his daughter claimed his house here in Bombay saying that Jinnah was neither a Sunni nor a Shia, that he was not a Muslim. He was a Koja uh, of the Ismaili sect and they follow the customary law of the Luhanas, which is the Hindu law, where if there is only a daughter, then she can inherit all his property. So I once wrote an article in the Daily Times. You know, there is a English rhyme, uh, the house that Jack built. You know, it's a rhyme for children. I said, the houses that Jinnah built. The Malabar house is in dispute and the house in Pakistan is dispute. What was it all about? So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. My name is Vikram Ramaswamy and I have a question. I have actually two questions. One is historical, which uh, in fact, you know, I have read uh, Rajmohan Gandhi's Punjab, 
where he talks about the problem of the local populace irrespective, irrespective of religion being foreign invaders like you know back then it was the mughals somewhere about 150 or 200 years ago and uh, so then we talk of jinnah here like you rightly said wherein he he kind of kind of made it us versus them mm. right so how did that happen where you know punjabis as a people started looking at each other as us versus them that's the first question and uh, second question coming to today's context yeah. so and coming to today's context you know the measures that you know what has happened in the past cannot be undone but at least what we can do in the future right so so the steps that are taken to bring in peace into this region at best seem ineffective and at worst they seem you know useless if i may use the word sorry But say it again the steps taken to yeah. bring in peace in this region seem ineffective at best yes and at worst they seem like you know futile let me put futile. it futile futile okay. yes okay and uh, what do you think that you know modern day leaders should do i mean i think the this kashmir and all of that is you know is a broken yeah. record being played again and again yeah. yeah so thank you very much why did the punjabis uh accept the invaders as the heroes that's the question they get my question was punjabi muslims ha huh? punjabi muslims it was earlier you know over 200 years maybe during the time of uh, it all started it all started actually during the british period with the hindi urdu controversy in 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 the up uh and then under sir sayed's influence the upper class muslim gentry everywhere decided that in the census records they will give urdu as their mother tongue okay and incidentally among the six they started saying that we should return punjabi rather gurmukhi as their mother tongue and i think the hindus in punjab also started returning hindi as their mother tongue in the census records uh so this was done during the british period when the census thing started huh? how many muslims were there in in a certain area played a very important role in terms of influence in terms of contesting elections and so on uh and this then when the freedom struggle started the british needed to counter it with with some measures and they granted the muslims separate electorates in 1909 and the six in 1919 in punjab the muslims were a majority the six were given over representation in the whole of india the muslims were uh, in a minority so they were given over representation and that ultimately the, the thing is in 1943 when the second last viceroy lord wevel came linith go who was transferring power said we are here for another 30 years which would have meant 1973 so they were not thinking of giving india even dominion status dominion status was only for the white colonies settler colonies uh giving complete freedom was out of the question but the second world war broke the back of the british the economy was in shambles and american pressure was to transfer power but while transferring power the british military at the very last i call it the twilight moment in decision making thought that a partition in india with jinnah pro west uh, coming up in pakistan would be a a better bet in fact sir francis tucker lieutenant general sir francis tucker head of the eastern command there were four commands in in india eastern in calcutta southern in madras northern in rawalpindi and central here in delhi i think uh, he wrote a book while memory serves where he says that we need to create an islamic arc starting in algeria through arabia deserta down persia into northern hindustan 
a Muslim state armed with Islamic ideology and British science to act as a bulwark against the spread of communism. So Pakistan was created primarily for that objective. And while the British receded as the world power, the Americans took up the same project and the Afghan Jihad was actually conducted through Pakistan. So that's the role Pakistan was created and the Muslim voting and so on. So that's the background. Hmm. The next question about uh, what do you foresee leaders can do? Huh, what, yeah. what can leaders do? First of all, they should mind the language they use. Uh, like Bilawal Bhutto, uh, you know, if you want peace with India, you can't use words like the words he used for your prime minister. I think it's not done by the chief diplomat of Pakistan. He's Pakistan's foreign minister. So one, they have to, they have to temper down their way of addressing. Yari, who's speaking? I'm being disturbed. Uh, please don't speak. Haji. So I think, and from your side, I mean, there are equally uh, wild comments. Somebody has to rein them in. So that's one thing to be done. And I think Pakistan more than India needs to correct course because uh, I think the greater responsibility for what has gone wrong lies with Pakistan. And I'm staying, saying it in Bangalore, I've said it in Lahore, in Karachi, everywhere. And I think the people accept that. So I think we, a lot needs to be done, but we as concerned citizens can also play our role. Yeah. yeah. Um, my name is uh, Ramesh Hosakare. Uh, first of all, Professor, I really acknowledge you all the work that you have done. And I have not come across anybody who has presented the facts, you know, before partition and, you know, in, in the process of partition. And I, by chance, came across one of your YouTubes. And then, since then, I got interested and I have tracked a lot of things that you say on YouTube. I haven't read your, your books, though. Okay. So, really, uh, thank you for all the work. And it's very valuable for India and Pakistan and world, really. Uh, I have two things to uh, say. One is a question about history and second is about what you said, what could be done. First thing is the, the bloodbath that took uh, during partition. Uh, I think in one of the YouTubes that you said, like the first one that I actually watched, was the genesis was in a, a massacre of Sikh community in Rawalpindi. That's correct. Right? Yeah. And you said that. When, but in the... In your talk here, you said it was in Bengal and then came all the way to Punjab, and that's no, what you said. No, I said why Bengal escaped that thing in '47 was no, that, because before it had that taken said, place already, yeah, right. but on a much smaller scale, Calcutta and then Noakhali and Tripura right. also. But the scale of the Punjab riots or its pogroms, you know, killing on a massive right. scale. So right. there is no comparison. Right. right. Yeah. Got it. Now. What you said about what could be done, I think, and many people say that, that line of control as the border and trade should start and other things, or politicians should, or leaders should change their language. But I think Pakistan is on a course, and that is irreversible right now, you know. I don't see any leadership. Mr. Ramesh, I'm sorry. Is there a question? No, I, I want him to make a comment on yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. To kindly keep it short because there are yeah. people. Sure. There are other people sure. who want sure. to ask. Sure. Hmm. And uh, mindset of people over the last two generations is kind of stuffed with so much uh, incorrect history. That, and there is financially now, the, economically the country is collapsing. I think it is, there is nobody, it's out of control right now. And I think India has chosen not to do anything, only focus on getting Kashmir, okay? And let Pakistan go the way it goes. And that is the way the Indian stance that Indian government has taken. Okay. So I think it's going to go the way it will go, okay? And no, no world is not helping. So I want you to say, uh, what is, what are you, what do you, but I think you have hope that things will change. And I'm talking against I, that. I'll, I'll, I'll try yeah. to argue my case, huh? 
first of all, if Pakistan doesn't correct uh, its course and things go from bad to worse, one day Pakistan will disintegrate. So uh, all I can say that I warned them and if they, it disintegrates, it will be very sad. It will be a very bloody yeah. affair. Yeah. I know I've talked to people from 47, the, the horrors they went through. You can multiply them <laughs> by the way the Sindhis and Punjabis, you know, the people have settled in different areas, will, will have to run for their life. So uh, I think it would be horrific if that were to happen. But if that happens, so what? What can I do? History is not resting on my shoulders. I've done my duty to warn. There is a theory in political science which might illustrate my point. Thomas Hobbes' theory of the state is that once upon a time we were all living in the state of nature, where we were equal and free. But since our nature is aggressive, we seek power and domination. It was a war of all against all. Life was short, brutish and nasty. <laughs> and he said, well, that was the state of nature. But if human nature was just that, then there was no chance that we would transcend it to establish something better. So humans decided to establish the state under civil law, which restricted total equality and total freedom, but gave everybody security, and then the state decided rights and so on. I said that uh, Pakistan is now fast descending into the state of nature. If Hobbes is right, then it must correct course. Mm. That's the rational way of doing it. And if it doesn't, then Hobbes is wrong and not me. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Namaste, sir. My name is Prasad. It's really an honor to be in your presence. I have two questions. One is, uh, recently I saw a clip on the social media where it was said that if Netaji was around, partition wouldn't have happened. This comment was made by a very prominent personality. Um, that is my first question. Is that so? Uh, I want your comment on that. Second question is, what do you think of the legacy of Gandhiji? Ah, yeah. Okay. Ah, so, so, at, yeah. so okay. um, on these two. Yeah, these two. First of all, I don't know why they made this statement about Jinnah having any particular liking for Bose. There is no evidence of it. And Bose had left India already in 41. And he was giving the call for armed revolution and it actually started. And I, my argument is that the, uh, the Quit India movement was a decision taken by the Congress reluctantly because Bengal and these places were, you know, Letaji was hoping that the Japanese would win the war, although I think that was a major miscalculation. The Americans had already entered the war and there was no chance that the war would ge go the way Netaji imagined. Huh? So there is no evidence that Jinnah had any particular liking for uh, Bose. In 1938, uh, I have quoted Bose's letter to Jinnah saying that you claim that the Muslim League is the only party of Muslims. And he says, we can understand and accept that you are the, one of the major parties, but there are other Muslim parties as well. Khudai Khidmat Gar, Ittihad Party, uh, Majlis -e Harad, they were all allies of the Congress. Jinnah writes back and says, for any discussion between us, the Congress must not only accept that the Muslim League is the sole party of Muslims, but that the Congress is a Hindu party. Now, is that a positive response to what Bose had offered? Not at all. So from where did this person, you know, imagine that they had Bose been around, then uh, Jinnah would not have demanded partition? I think it's an absurd suggestion. Uh, and somebody has quoted me in the uh, in, in, in a newspaper saying this. Uh, so that puts my visa in jeopardy, you know. <laughs> but I think it's worth taking the risk. Hmm? I've been here long enough now. 
on the legacy of gandhi ji ha ji gandhi ji i think was one of the finest human beings who walked on this earth uh, that's my understanding people who uh, uh, abuse him and ridicule him and so on i think that's a pathological state of mind because gandhi ji i would say was a champion of the civil society questioning he was an anarchist peaceful anarchist questioning the status quo and so on and all his life is in that direction and uh, of course i know punjabi hindus have a big objection that when in 47 he saved muslim lives here and there he didn't come to punjab and helped us and uh, the way i understand gandhi ji went to places where people were willing to invite him whereas the punjab being a loyalist province was never uh, a stronghold of the congress it wasn't of the muslim league either until the second world war so these two national level parties could make a breakthrough only uh, uh, after 39 Uh, more so the muslim league because this was muslim majority areas and so that's way that's the only reason i think with gandhi ji was not in the punjab but in bengal uh, so at all moments where he had to make a decision i think i stand by his decisions he could have done them uh, uh, you know they may be with the hide side of history one can have a question like the khilafat movement but i don't think it was a wrong decision at all it's the muslims who came to him and had gandhi ji refused then the muslims would say that you want us to be part of the national struggle but an issue which is very dear to us and you are not willing to help us then there would be no moral grounds for him to appeal to muslims so he did it out of the best of intentions and i don't think the khilafat movement was a reactionary movement at all there is a misinterpretation distortion going on about the khilafat movement as well uh, in the end of course the turks themselves abolished the khilafat movement but there is a very interesting part to it uh, you know in 1919 the treaty of serbs which was forced upon the turkey sultan took away all the territories from turkey in asia minor only istanbul and a narrow strip into anatolia was left and ataturk then started the war of resistance and the what the british did then was to get a letter written by agha khan and sayed amir ali amir ali was an asna shari shia mainstream shia and uh agha khan was a ismaili both are shia and khilafat is not their issue at all and they were telling the muslim uh, the turks to support the sultan now when he was all defeated and the territories had been taken away abul kalam azad then issued a counter argument that support uh, ataturk because he is fighting for the independence of turkey now that's not reported in in this so the indian muslims were of course attracted to the symbol of the khalifa and so on and uh, gandhi ji helping them i think was the right thing to do but politics un unintended consequences happen so that's the only time where people think that he encouraged fundamentalism that's all wrong yeah in the interest of time we're going to just take one more question okay. all the others i request you to wait around professor sahab will be here you can have time with him later but one more question to wrap up our session hi uh, my name is ishan wadwa uh, i can trace my ancestry to peshawar and uh, lialpur faisalabad now uh, i have uh, one question about the past and again about the future uh, about the past being that uh, <clears throat> clearly the british did not have noble intentions when they were ruling us and uh, they left us in this array for specific reasons as you rightly mentioned uh, it was a geo strategic move uh, do you think they condoned violence 
which, Sorry? Do you think they condoned violence which happened throughout the partition uh, time, given the amount of inflammatory speeches given by both sides? And I'm not sure how many uh, people were convicted for passing such speeches that in indulging in violence when the British had the police under them. Yeah. That's one question. Second being that, uh, <clears throat> given the geostrategic shifts we are seeing now, Sorry? Given the geostrategic shifts we are seeing now, yeah. and Pakistan losing its importance in the American eyes, and India becoming a bigger client for the United States right now, do you think it's only up to India and Pakistan to have peace between them, given the amount of competing interests we have, say from defense yes. manufacturers, etc.? Very interesting questions. Uh, could you repeat the first one? The second one caught my attention too much. Right. The, the first, first one. one was that, uh, do you think it's at a certain level the British Yeah, yeah, if the British. Not, uh, well, I have given evidence. You know, there is a saying in Hindi, forgive me, that Billy Sher ko har cheez sikha deti hai swaiz peed pe chadne ka. The British did all these tricks, but nothing like papers written are in, they burnt, I've even quoted British auth uh, authors saying that they burnt m m uh, many papers of the intelligence services before they transferred power. So there were local interferences and, for example, uh, the British troops in India were ordered not to intervene in the communal conflicts, they were to intervene only if European lines, lives were uh, at stake. And so while the Hindus, Muslim Sikhs killed one another, they let that happen, saying that, look, this is what you are doing to one another. I, in my Punjab book, I've given a lot of evidence of it. And then there are other sources as well, suggesting some sort of uh, hidden hand doing things, yeah. And the second one was, uh, if these Pakistan and India can on their own sort their problems out. Well, I understand the international game going on. I think the Chinese need Pakistan to keep a handle on India. The Americans need India to keep a handle on China. And so this is how things are happening. Uh, uh, but I have said that if India and China claim to be continuous s s civilizations for thousands of years, can't they sit down and just sort out the international border and make all other actors irrelevant in Asia? It can be easily done. So I think many things can be done if there is a will and there is a, there is a vision to do it. Thank you. Thank you, I, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to check out, was there a sinister design uh, for these guys to adopt Urdu as their national language? Or was it just what people say, that they just said it's Islamic language, so it, Urdu should be the national language of Pakistan? Your thoughts on that? First Thank of you. all, uh, some of the greatest writers of Urdu have come from all the religions. Munshi Premchand, the greatest short story writer and novelist, huh? wrote in Urdu. It's only towards the end of his life that he started writing in Hindi. Krishan Chandar, the great novelist, short story writer, a Hindu writing in Urdu. Rajinder Singh Bedi, huh, ji? Uh, Sahil Lidhyanmi, Muslim, okay. But there are many names. So, to associate, ji, ha, Firak Gorakhpuri is another name, and one can go on and on and on. Ha, ji. So, but the controversy started in 19, no, sorry, 1886 uh, or so, where in the UP, I think, a Hindi movement started, that Hindi should be the state language in UP. Because up until then, the British had adopted Urdu after they took over from the Mughals. And the Kaist Hindus and the Kashmiri Brahmins were 
well versed in Persian, Arabic, and then Urdu as well. So some of them were also serving the state at that time. Uh, but then the Hindi movement started that we want Hindi to be the national language, uh, the state language. And Sir Sayyid then took out a stand that, look, if Hindi is the language of the Hindus, then the Urdu is the mother tongue of Muslims. And then it became a cardinal principle of the Muslim League. In 1928, the Motilal Nehru report, which I have supported very strongly uh, in its recommendations for the future constitution of India, says that Hindustani will be the national language of India with two scripts, Devnagri and Urdu Naslik. And English will continue for some time to come. And every province will have their own mother tongue as their state language. I think that was a very fair approach. In 36, again, the Congress came up with such a proposal. But Jinnah Saab is then on record saying that Hindustani is no language. It is Congress propaganda. And Urdu is the mother tongue of Muslims. So Pakistan stands on two legs. Islam and Urdu, and they have oppressed the regional languages of Pakistan. And there's a lot of resentment against that. But that state's ideology, OK? Yeah. On behalf of the BIC, Professor Sam, I thank you so much for coming here and shedding light on such an important part of our collective history. Wish you the best for your travels ahead. Thank you. <laughs>